Welcome back to Truth to Tell. I'm Michelle Ali Marati. And I'm Andy Driscoll, and welcome all of you to this fifth in our Civic Media Communications Connections Series, Community Connections Series of Shows on Location. And we're broadcasting live on KFAI in the Twin Cities from the lecture hall of the Leibovitz School of Business and Economics here at the University of Minnesota at Duluth, or UMD. We traveled to Duluth to meet head-on the persistent issue of pending permits to open up the huge load of copper and nickel underneath part of what is called the Laurentian Divide, look it up, uh, including much of the Mesabi Range and tribal areas around northern Minnesota. We've talked, uh, this is about whether or not polymet mining and twin metals companies should be allowed to scrape open at least two massive sulfide mine pits, so to extract from the so-called Duluth complex the third richest loads of copper and nickel in the world while the lakes, rivers, and water tables, and air quality suffer the nasty side effects of sulfide-derived acids. And of those projects, perhaps destroying forevermore the pristine waters and their unique crop of manumen, or wild rice, which is held sacred by the Ojibwe natives. We talked at length on Truth to Tell about this topic, but we really wanted to make this fifth radio and television special about what people up here have to say about all this, knowing that no small amount of conflict exists when jobs may be at stake, but at the expense of the environment. A preliminary supplement uh, to the draft environmental impact statement required by the federal EPA, and probably DNR as well, right, uh, will be out in its entirety any day now, but some copies of it have leaked out and you'll find out where to find those documents online just a little bit later. We want to say thank you to all the great community partners working with us this month as well. Right now, we want you to experience a short film, though, first, before we get into too much detail, about uh, it's a powerful film created by filmmaker Nate uh, Tachek. Yep. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> for uh, he was for one of our partners. Uh, he produced this film. It's for the Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. So we'll watch that short video here quick before we get started. Boundary Waters is a wilderness area unlike any other. I think there's a part of it that really is essential for the human soul. We don't have very many places like that left on Earth. There's fewer places in the world where you can hear, you know, that absolute silence. You know, really, it became a destination for me for the rest of my life. The Friends of the Boundary Waters were formed to help pass legislation that would permanently protect the Boundary Waters as wilderness. I think the important thing to realize is that the Boundary Waters is protected, but it's not safe. And there are really big issues facing it. This is copper nickel mining largely that's been proposed at, at the very edge of the wilderness. It has really long lasting implications. The sulfides that are unearthed from this mining operation create sulfuric acid. And so that makes water systems, whether they're lakes or rivers or streams, highly acidic. Sulfuric acid can then further leach additional heavy metals out of the rock that they're flowing over. So you get what are toxic levels of heavy metal contaminants presenting itself as a human health risk. These are long-term consequences we have to think about as a state. The threat of that sulfuric acid in, in other metals and toxic metals coming into the watershed of the Boundary Waters is very, very disturbing. Our goal is not to let that happen at all. We have looked around the world and around the country. There is not a single mine of this type that operates in sulfide ores that has done it without polluting its waters. Not one. Why in the world would we really think that this could be done right here in such a water-rich environment? 
I don't think a lot of people understand or even know that there are new mines proposed or understand what the risks are and what the implications of those mines can be. And that doesn't seem like a very good way to make a, a decision. It is an incredibly beautiful landscape. It's unique in Minnesota. You know, I just think that's something worth defending and passing along. Again, thanks to uh, Nate Tachek and Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. And uh, as I understand it, of course, Water Legacy has already had also a, a couple of videos out, and we'll have, uh, we'll try to get the, the links to those up and perhaps even include it in our online distribution later on. Um, but we want to thank, uh, thank them both for that. Well, anyway, now let's get to the history and various positions of the uh, our panelists uh, that we can meet tonight, uh, returning to our program, uh, this time in person, I've never met her before tonight, uh, is Nancy Schultz, and she's Water Policy Director, uh, Water Resource Policy Director for the Fond du Lac uh, Band of Lake Superior, Chippewa. Nancy, welcome to you. Thank you, Andy. Nice to have you here. And also returning to Troop the Tell with her special brand of understanding the policy parts of this issue is Water Legacy's Policy Director, Attorney Paula McAbee. Paula, welcome back. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Lovely to be here. And congratulations on your group's award from the Headwaters Foundation last month for your work on this issue. Thank you again. They did great work. Aaron Clems is the Policy and Communications Director for the Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. And we, Aaron, um, where is Aaron? Right oh, there. No, I'm, yep. I'm just kidding. Aaron, welcome. Thanks for uh, providing tonight's video, too. Thank you. And finally, representing the Carlton County uh, Central Labor Body is its president, Tamara Jones, who also serves as a union rep for local, is it 1189? 1189. 1189 of the United Food and Commercial Workers. Tamara, welcome to you. Thanks, Michelle. Glad to have you on. It's the old retail clerks union. I remember yeah. that. <laughs> Because we really want the uh, you audience participants uh, to have a crack at being part of this conversation, uh, I'll take one of our roving microphones into the crowd right after our break at the uh, bottom of the hour. Uh, then after we sign off our live feed to the subscriber of radio station KFAI in this case in the Twin Cities, uh, we'll keep cameras and microphones rolling after the end of that program for another half hour of dialogue, uh, which we'll put up on YouTube and our website and your website and anyone else wanting to do this. Uh, but right now, to start off our conversations, we'd like each of our panelists to sort of talk about uh, some of the unique sulfide mining issues facing their particular constituencies and the state as a whole. And Paula, let's start with you since you're just knee deep, neck deep, eye deep uh, in uh, public policy around uh, this stuff. Uh, would you update us all on where things stand relative now to the permitting of this mine and why Water Legacy uh, opposes its development? Sure, um, Andy, I think the important thing for Water Legacy, oftentimes sulfide mining is portrayed as an issue of jobs and environment. And Water Legacy's mission is to protect Minnesota's water resources and the communities that rely on those resources. So we're looking not just at the environment, but at what does sulfide mining do to human health? And in addition to affecting pristine wilderness areas like that gorgeous film showed us, sulfide mining, the, the sulfur in the rock, the crushing of rock to the consistency of powder, it leaches very toxic chemicals into the environment. Mercury, which bioaccumulates in fish, arsenic, which is a carcinogen if it gets into the drinking water, lead, which is also toxic to the brains of particularly developing children. And we've learned this past year with research done by the Minnesota Department of Health that manganese, which is a byproduct of the 
sulfur, sulfur mining and actually to some extent the taconite mining, it gets into the drinking water and that can reduce the IQ in children. So what we're looking at is health. And one of the things, Andy was saying we have the preliminary supplementary draft EIS. What it means is we have PolyMet's early plan and explanation of what that sulfide mine would do to the community. And we were talking before we started how frustrating it is that that document refuses to analyze what the impacts of this mine might be on the people working in that mine. The document talks about off-site workers and the public, but it doesn't ever ask the question, what will happen to the people who work in that mine, in that plant where that rock is being crushed? And the reason it's so important, the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota Health Department have been working now for several years on a study about what happens to the health of taconite workers who are exposed in their workplace to asbestos-like fibers. And the preliminary report was just released a couple months ago. And I'm going to show a chart. This chart here, and I, I think it, you can see it from a pretty good distance, they asked the question of, how many mesothelioma cases are there likely to be based on just population numbers? And what they found out is that there were 300% more than expected. Just looking at the population, if it were random, if they were not specific workers in these mines, 15 people would have died, but in this population, 45 people died. Now, they don't have the final statistics done but this kind of pattern wasn't showing up in the public, it wasn't showing up in the spouses, so it has to do with the work. And what was less publicized, in addition to the mesothelioma, there were increased risks of lung cancer and heart disease. So a total of 650 more people died among taconite workers than were expected. And what do we have at PolyMet? PolyMet is the part of the deposit that's most likely to have these asbestos-like fibers. And PolyMet says that 9% of the particle pollution will be these fibers. Yet they haven't studied, they haven't looked at what will happen to these workers, and they're planning at that plant that the exhaust will go right back into the plant so the workers will get a double dose. So Water Legacy is concerned about the wilderness and we're concerned about the water and the environment. And we're also asking that we've got to ask about the people. What's going to happen to the kids? What's going to happen to the workers? And we're going to need better research and more candor. Thank you very much, Paula. Okay, let's uh, go down to the other end right here, and let's talk to Tamara Jones. Uh, Tamara, uh, she was speaking about workers. You work with workers. You are a worker. You uh, head up the Carleton County uh, Labor uh, uh, Assembly. Would you talk about uh, this from a labor perspective, please? Well, last year, Carleton County Central Labor Body went on record as being opposed to sulfide mining. It wasn't a popular position in the labor movement. Um, in fact, it's probably not popular that I'm here right now. But I was struck by what you were talking about, Paula, about the worker, the worker health, because it ties into one of the things that I have concerns about, which is worker safety. Glencore, which is the parent company of PolyMet, has the fifth worst safety record on mine safety in the world. And I'm wondering if they can't provide safe mines in other parts of the world, why do we think they're gonna do it here? And the answer I hear from other labor members is that, well, we have great regulations. Well, that ties into what I was thinking about when I started to learn that the Chamber of Commerce has filed lawsuits to weaken the water regulation, the water um, quality standards. Why would they stop there? Why wouldn't they start to go after worker regulations, worker safety, anything the to- Chamber of Commerce here in Duluth? I believe it's the Minnesota Chamber of it's Commerce. The whole, okay, it's statewide. The Minnesota okay. Chamber, okay. Is there a Northeastern yeah. Chamber too? Is there, do we know that? Okay. Some of us don't follow the Chambers of yeah. Commerce. <laughs> All right, go ahead. So I guess I, I yeah, th th yeah. those are concerns that I have that tie into the health of the worker, the safety of the worker. And um, I just got data from a poll and, um, that says that in, April 2013, there was a poll conducted of about 400 Northeastern Minnesota voters, and 44% of self-identified union house households opposed sulfide mining. So I think the mm. issue is deeply divided, um, and I, I guess that's Among the I workers, well, thank you very much. All right. Erin uh, Clems, why don't you uh, jump in with the Friends of the Boundary Waters uh, Wilderness? And now you have a constituency all into your own, uh, way up there in the BWC. Well, I wouldn't say it's all to our own. I mean, I think I think the, the Boundary Waters Wilderness is is everybody's 
and uh, nobody owns it. And the one thing that we really, I mean, our mission at the Friends of the Boundary Waters is to protect and preserve and to restore the wilderness character of the Boundary Waters wilderness, but also the whole Quetico Superior ecosystem. And this relates to not just the wilderness area itself, the 1.1 million acres that we've deemed and protected, but also that area that surrounds it too. Uh, um, uh, Aaron, describe the quote Quetico area. I, I'm not sure. Roughly, that it's, roughly, it's the Superior National Forest, the area to the north of there. It's 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 our North Woods, basically. Okay. You know, the northeastern part of the state. All right. Um, and and we're we're at a critical tipping point. The decisions that we make in the next few years will determine what the shape of the ecosystem health is, what our communities will look like, um, and the choices that we make today will determine the vision that we have for the future for Minnesota. Uh, and at the Friends of the Boundary Waters, our concern is that we're gonna make choices that look at short-term gain, perhaps at the expense of very long-term damage to these ecosystems and to these communities. Um, one, the video that you just saw, um, Betsy Dobb, who's the policy director at Friends of the Boundary Waters, makes a point that we continue to make and we haven't heard a response to yet, which is we've never been shown an example of a mine of this type that is operated without polluting the area around it. Uh, and that's a really important point. The things that cause pollution in these mines are inexorable forces of nature and chemistry. Uh, they don't just, you can't make them go away. When you expose this stuff, the, the rock, and you, as, you, as Paula says, grind it to the consistency of powder and expose it to air and water, it releases acid, it releases metals, and there's nothing you can do about that except try to contain it, uh, and we have a miserable record at containing that. And, 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 you have some illustrations of that, I yeah, believe. Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, do you want to talk a little bit yeah, about The, the photo that, that you're seeing up there, and it's kind of hard to see, uh, you, it looks a little orangey, uh, but one of the hallmarks of acid runoff from mines of this type is that it picks up a lot of metals uh, iron, copper, manganese, other kinds of metals. Uh, and what you're seeing here are pictures that aren't from some faraway place. They are from an area about two and a half, three miles from the edge of the Boundary Waters Wilderness uh, on the Spruce Road outside of Ely. Uh, these are, this is the runoff from a number of test pits that a company named Inco, uh, exploring the same area that Twin Metals is looking at right now to build a mine. Uh, in the 1970s, they excavated a couple of basically test pits, little strip mines. Uh, to analyze what they found in terms of metal. And they never remediated them, they left them there. Uh, and then 30, 40 years later, uh, they're still producing the kind of runoff that we could expect on a much larger scale. And these are the ferrous metals now of iron ore, are they not? Well, they're, they're, all, they're, they're, they're mixed together to some extent, Excuse me, right? Yeah. But once you, once you add, once, the, once you have runoff that is more acidic, it can pick up iron as well, which is why it looks orange like that. I see. Um, All right. So it's a rust effect that we're seeing is kind of orange. Yeah, but, but that's yeah. an that, that's more of a symptom than it is really the problem. It's, yeah. it, it, it's kind of a but it warning makes it more sign. makes it easier for us to see yeah. the prevalence and of the, it and, when it, it, and this is well before these new mines will be going in. So uh, right. and we'll we'll get right back to you in just a second, sure. Paula and the guys. But Nancy, uh, the Fond du Lac Indian uh, tribe is uh, is always concerned about the water, uh, not just for its uh, supply of water resource uh, purity, but for the monomen, uh, the wild rice. We, uh, perhaps you can talk about the uh, position of the Fond du Lac. Uh, well, band, sure, I could talk a little bit about why Fond du Lac has gotten so actively engaged in reviewing and participating as a cooperating agency on the PolyMed draft EIS process. Um, I started working for the Fond du Lac Band almost 16 years ago. I was hired to help them build a water quality program, and we have one of the better tribal water quality programs in the nation. We've done a lot of good work. Um, one of the things that we pursued was a federally approved water quality standards program. There's only about 40 tribes nationwide that have that delegated authority. We're another water quality regulator. We have 23 miles of the St. Louis River as our boundary, and we are downstream of Polymet. Mm -hmm. We're downstream of six other active taconite facilities, and I make less of a distinction than some others as to the concerns about sulfide mining because we have ample evidence of how mining is conducted in the state of Minnesota and has been for over a century 
and the impacts that we can see and measure on the landscape, in the water, in the air today from existing mines that are regulated. And if you think about adding the additional problems associated with the release of toxic metals from um, sulfide mining processing, you're just adding one more element of environmental degradation to something that we're already pretty familiar with. So, and, and yet, the Fond du Lac tribe hasn't taken, did you say, not an official position in opposition to these particular The Fond du Lac mines? tribal leadership has stated over and over again, very publicly, that they are not opposed to economic development. They are actively engaged and we are being directed to be engaged in this mining review because we want to ensure that this industry operates under all appropriate federal and state laws and regulations. And sadly, after about eight years of working to understand how mining takes place and how mining is regulated in the state of Minnesota, that's a, um, unfortunately too high a bar to be met at this point in time. Yeah, well, that can be, uh, that I can understand. Now, there are some of our listeners uh, down in the Twin Cities especially who would like to know, well, what's, what, what does this have to do with me? Uh, we're down here in the cities. Uh, we, what, what, should, what should that have to do with us down here? Uh, you know, we can, we can uh, rail like crazy about what's happening to Lake Superior or, uh, or, the, or the, uh, the St. Louis River or something, but it doesn't always uh, it doesn't always hit home until somebody's backyard is hit, uh, like the spills of the oil in their uh, Arkansas and things like that. So, uh, okay, Paula, go ahead and talk a little bit about I that. Guess the, the question you're asking is why does it matter? Yeah. And one of the words that Aaron used is a tipping point. And I think what we're seeing here in northern Minnesota in terms of our water resources is a tipping point. If you look at the St. Louis River, that watershed, there have already been 68,000 acres that have been destroyed of watershed as a result of mining. And so we're seeing the point where adding the PolyMet project is likely not only to violate groundwater standards, surface water standards, add pollutants that are harmful to human beings, but it has a potential to destroy another 8,000 acres of wetlands. And so the question is, what are we doing to the water quality of the St. Louis River, which is the largest tributary to Lake Superior? It has the estuary where the fish are birthed that fishermen rely on in Lake Superior. So we're saying, we're, what's at stake for us, maybe some of us who live in the Twin Cities, is this important watershed. There's one other question. This is a watershed, after all. This is a watershed. Yeah. There's no other Great Lakes. This is it. In, in not only in Minnesota, not only in the United States, but this is the greatest body of fresh water that we have in this world, and it is at risk. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry, we'll, we'll come back to a lot of these questions, uh, but, but right now we got to tell you we're live uh, from, this is a fast half hour, isn't it? We're live from the Leibovitz School of Business Auditorium uh, at UMD in Duluth, and we're talking with many of the lake stakeholders in the copper nickel mining projects being proposed for this entire area and the impacts uh, that we and they can expect uh, from digging out the non-ferrous sulfate uh, based metals that could fatally contaminate the natural resources of the entire northeastern Minnesota quadrant and, uh, and the Lake Superior watershed. So our panelists who will now be able to respond to questions and comments from the studio participants here uh, that's you out there in this wonderful audience of ours. Uh, our Water Legacies, Paula McAbee to my right, uh, Fon, uh, the Fond du Lac Tribe's Nancy Schultz uh, to uh, Michelle's left, uh, friends of the BWCA policy person and communicator, uh, Aaron Clems, right on here, and labor activist, Tamara Jones. And we'll be taking a short break here and more of this conversation when we return live here on Truth to Tell Community Connections. Stay, Stay with, with us. us. You are watching Truth to Tell's Community Connections series. 
You are listening to Fresh Air Community Radio, KFAI, 90.3 FM Minneapolis and 106.7 FM St. Paul and online at kfai.org. The time now is 7.26 and we are broadcasting live from the LSBE Auditorium. LSBE is good enough. <laughs> at uh, University of Minnesota Duluth. This is Truth to Tell Community Connections, and I'm Michelle Ali Marati. And I'm Andy Driscoll, and uh, welcome back to the second half of our program. And I'm playing Phil Donahue this evening, uh, uh, wandering around with this microphone and wanting to talk to our sizable audience. We're delighted to have. We have a hand going up right away, but. Uh, uh, we want to make sure that everybody knows that we have Aaron Clems, Paula Maccabee, Nancy Schultz, and Tamara Jones as our panelists. You can direct your questions and comments to them, as well as to the studio, uh, the rest of the audience. And we'll just come on back here. And uh, and we. Andy, are do we want to talk a little bit about what we're doing next month, quickly? Let's do it. So that's what happens <laughs> He's trying when you to don't wing it a... here. Right. Uh, we like to, when we come back from the break, just give you a, a little preview of what our next month's Community Connections Forum is going to be. And next month, it'll be um, Ray Lynn, who's actually wandering around the audience in he here, and I will be doing a show on youth empowerment, uh, which will be at the Avalon School in St. Paul. And we'll be talking about ways that we can uh, have successful youth in uh, activism, education, and job readiness. Uh, so join us for that from the Avalon School Wednesday, July 10th, uh, that evening. And that one will not be live, but uh, we'll bring that for you on KFAI the following Monday after that. As, as well as uh, SPNN and, and MTN. And on SPNN and MTN cable access channels And those are well. the cha cable access channels in the Twin Cities, and we're hoping to distribute a lot of this stuff to other cable systems around. And for all state, of you folks so. up here in Duluth, you can watch all of it online as well. Yes. It'll be all online. The, all right. So should we get back to talking about... We should get <coughs> to our audience binding? now, yes. <clears throat> and we're here in the audience, and we have a guy named Gebhardt. Gerhardt, I'm sorry, Gerhardt. Hi. Uh, tell us, uh, your, uh, Gerhardt, whom and what, what's your affiliation? I'm Gerhardt Quast. I live here in Duluth, and I... That's my affiliation, I guess. Okay. I will address my question to Ms. Maccabee from Water Legacy. I understand for environmental reasons why it would be a very good idea not to have any sulfite mining in northern Minnesota. That's great. Uh, also, I have a laptop. I like my toys. I see several computers up there. We are a metals using society. Have you attempted to work with Polymet or any of the mining companies to ask if I'd like to have them do metals extraction responsibly. Those two concepts in the same sentence I haven't heard anybody talk about yet. And are they mutually exclusive? Uh, well, Paula, start us out. Well, there are two different questions. One is do we need <laughs> copper to make the toys that we all have? And at least for now, we do. But is there another way to get copper other than by digging a huge hole in the ground and then digging another huge hole to get the coal or the natural gas for the energy to do that? And the answer is yes, we can recycle it. And in the United States, we have changed actually our practices. We are now getting about 50% of our copper from recycling. And that's without recycling our toys. It's mostly from industry. So I think the first thing I'd say is let's save 85 to 90% of the energy required and let's get the metals for our toys by recycling our old toy before we get a new one. And that I think is the more responsible thing. One other thing, it may be possible to do sulfide mining responsibly in an arid area where everything is completely lined. I don't see the evidence that it's possible to do sulfide mining responsibly in an area like northeastern Minnesota where you're doing it on top of wetlands, where you're dumping tailings on top of a tailings basin that's already leaking, and where you're getting 29 or more inches of rain a year. I don't think it's possible. Well, Paula and anybody else that wants yeah, to Yeah, I think the, Nancy or Aaron. Yeah, I want to answer. Aaron has. Uh, well, the other, thing, the other yeah. thing that's going on, of course, is that's where the copper and nickel are right now. I mean, it's huge load down there. I, I took a look at the Duluth complex, and I couldn't believe how much copper and nickel are supposed to be there, something like $15 billion worth. Uh, Aaron? Well, I mean, it, 
By industry projections, it's a very large deposit. Uh, it's also a very low grade deposit. Part of the reason why it's taken so long for folks to bring interest. I mean, look, there's been copper mining being going on for hundreds of years. Why, why, why now, you know, is the question. And the reason is because of the expense and also the low grade nature of this ore body. And the risk Oh, it's a low grade, it's a low grade? Basically, so basically, uh, about 0.5% of the rock that they're looking for I see. is copper, okay? So, and that's, and that's the actual ore that they're looking for, not the rock that sits on top of it, not the dirt and the overburden. That's the actual ore itself. 99.5% of that will end up as waste. Um, and part of the reason why it's so difficult to uh, to, to avoid pollution in this particular location, not only because of what Nancy was saying with water, but just the huge volumes of waste rock that will be created by a mine like this. Yeah. One last quick thing about recycling. Um, as we have mined more and more, there is more metal out there to be recycled. You know, as, and, and so oh, yeah. there is, you know, I saw an industry website that projected that by about 2040, um, we would start thinking of recycling as the primary source of copper, and other metals, and that mining would be used to supplement that, right, when we needed extra, I guess. And so um, we have come a long way, too, in terms of the industrial waste stream and also consumer recycling of metals. And we have a long way to go. Uh, but it's certainly not our destiny that we have to dig, a scrape a hole in the ground, and pull out low-grade ore in this environment, especially with the risks that are involved with it. Does that answer your question, Gerhard? Okay, anything who's next? All right, let's go back here. Oh, uh, let's start with the old, older guy. Uh, no, this is Bob Tamman, everybody. <laughs> He's a good friend. I'm Bob Tamman from Sudan, Minnesota. And uh, I spent several years working in the mines, and I would enjoyed listening to th the conversation tonight about Lake Superior and the Boundary Waters, but I'd like to remind our friends in the metro that there's another watershed up here. If, oh. you, if you go to Hibbing, that's where the three major watersheds divide. Boundary Waters, Lake Superior, and the Mississippi River drainage. What is a watershed? A Bob? watershed is an area that they've delineated that has one pore point. The water in that particular area leaves at one point. That's how they like to define it. I see. So, uh, and then it's sort of, all water sort of moves through the system, right? And we have three major watersheds up here. And as I mentioned, we have tailings ponds leaking into every major watershed including the Mississippi River drainage. So when we talk about who has a dog in this fight, I think the Metro, in addition to enjoying the boundary waters, they're also getting the runoff from our mines. And the other, th okay. and they, the other thing- They are too, huh? They are what too. about the Jordan Aquifer? Is that affected by it? Uh, peripherally, I would say. Okay. And we, being you're gonna let me have the microphone a little bit, I'm gonna put in a plug <laughs> for the groundwater. No, you can't do it. I'm sorry. No. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. I'd, I'd like the state of Minnesota to do the groundwater atlas for St. Louis County. They've done it for several counties in southeastern Minnesota, several counties in the metro area. They haven't done a groundwater atlas for St. Louis County. We have a lot of irrevocable changes. What's an atlas? The state of Minnesota is publishing a booklet that examines the groundwater, they're doing it a county at a time, they're showing you where that groundwater comes from, where it goes, it's giving our scientific people a lot of good information, and we'd like one for St. Louis County. And being we're here at the Labovitz School of Business, one other point we should touch on is that the Labovitz School of Business puts out studies about mining, and they have a lot of good information, but as someone who's worked in the mines, I'd say that those studies are incomplete because they throw you some numbers out of context. Now, the last study that came out, uh, the first part of this year said that uh, Minnesota is getting 150 million in taxes and other income from the mining company. And it's a number, it sounds pretty good, but it's completely out of context. And so I couldn't find any more numbers in their report, but I went searching through economic literature and I found out that we sold, we exported $5 billion worth of ore. We that exported we, ore, that much ore. Five billion dollars. If you do the numbers, that means we collected 3% in taxes. And I think that's pitiful for a modern state to do worse than some banana republics. The Congo collects 4%. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, but. And so 
uh, there are some very well-informed people on your panel. If they'd like to comment on I'd some like of the to, things. I'd like to get a reaction from our panel on that. Not the Banana Republic part, <laughs> but the other part. Anybody up there? I, I think that um, what, what Bob Tammen was getting at is the question is who benefits. And we're, we play fast and loose with some of those economic numbers. One of the things that I, we need to know is that the number of jobs in the sulfide mining industry is dramatically decreasing. So the more metals are being extracted, but fewer people are being hired to do that same work. Also, what we might not realize, I know that Tamar before talked about Glencore as the primary owner of Polymet. Glencore has a deal where that all the copper concentrate Polymet's going to have to give it to them. They're the primary. They get the right to that copper. And Glencore this year, year made a huge merger with Extrata Company. And a condition of that merger was that all of the copper concentrate would go to China for the next eight years. So Minnesota, we get the hole in the ground. We get the risk to our surface water and our groundwater. And, and the copper leaves the state. And the copper leaves the country. And the country. And the profits leave the country. All right. Any other comments? Nancy? Yeah, I would just say Bob raised a few important issues, some that don't become part of the discussion very often. Things about protecting groundwater, drinking water sources. Yes. The existing mining that has been done on the Iron Range already has caused drinking water problems for communities on the range. Some communities are taking water from mine pits. Really? There's concerns about water can quality. Can they even clean it? I mean, can they clean it so it's potable? Uh, potentially, oh but there gosh. are, there are issues. Try? But more importantly, there are places like the city of Hibbing that are having to draw upon taxpayer dollars to drill new community municipal wells because yeah. mining activity, dewatering of mine pits, what happens to the changing of flow paths of groundwater means that municipal wells are going dry. So some of that money that's being made by the industrial activity um, is actually having to come back to, the, to those areas to fix problems that the mining itself caused. And so there are a lot of examples like that of hidden costs or sometimes not so hidden costs. Right now, the MnDOT is looking at relocating a highway, Highway 53, and they've known they were going to have to do that, but again, at a cost to taxpayers because of being able to accommodate mining. So there are a lot of costs that are never part of the calculus as to what happens to the community and what happens to the industry. Well, and we've had that issue come up when we've had Bob on the show before yeah. about um, accountability and how these mines or these mining companies can just come in, do this damage and leave before the damage is ever really assessed. And by, and by that time, we don't even know, you know what the cost is. I, I'd be curious, Paula, if you could maybe talk a little bit about that, about is there any talk of writing in some accountability into these agreements? There, there are two different problems. One is the problem that the mining companies go bankrupt and there's no money. So across the country, the largest source of Superfund liability is sulfide mining. And also, yeah, the, that, that's the part that kills me. I mean, I hear that all the time that these these pits are dug, and they're you know then they just sort of walk away from them, no matter how many promises they make to reclaim the land. Well, that's a corporate structure, and the EPA has estimated across the country that the total financial liability could be as much as 54 billion with a B, and there's just no taxpayer fund for that. But I think we need to also be really honest that some of the problems, like what Nancy was talking about, depleting groundwater or contaminating groundwater, they're not fixable. It's not just that the taxpayers would have to pony up an enormous amount of money, but there's certain things, once they're broke, they cannot be fixed. And we need to think about that as well when we're considering whether or not to allow sulfide mining in Minnesota. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. So we have a, we have a question here from a younger man, uh, younger than I, anyway. Uh, what's your name? My name is Max. And where are you from, Max? Uh, originally from Andover, uh, but I've been up here for five years. All right. <laughs> Stand up uh, and so they can see you, and I'm out of the camera's sure. shot. All right. <laughs> He's the guy that you want to look at right there. Yeah. All right. Talk about your, your subject. What did you well, I just had one short comment and then a question for the panel. Uh, the comment was um, 
I oftentimes hear when we're talking about sulfide mining and polymet specifically, people often lump those two together. And I guess I would just urge people to listen, you know, case by case, work on a case by case basis. So my question- You mean they're not one and the same? Uh, they all are different. I mean, the, they're-, they're Isn't polymet gonna be a sulfide mine? It is, oh. right. But I, I think like one of the biggest differences is which watershed it's in. Mm -hmm. And so that, that can play a part in, in um, in your decision on, you know, your, your opinions on Polymet. All right. So, okay. go, you do it. No, go ahead. <laughs> well, my question was about Polymet, and I just wanted to open up to the panel and ask you guys um, what your sort of one, uh, what, what was your strongest argument or the, the sort of the worst thing about Polymet that was inside the, the environmental impact statement or the ones that have come out so far? What's sort of, what's sort of your biggest concern that either is, uh, not in the environmental impact statement or hasn't been addressed to your liking? Tamara, can you start that out? I think as, Jones, <clears throat> as labor, we have a concern that jobs are being outsourced. You, you touched very well on that, so I'm not gonna repeat what you said, but also the jobs that are going to remain are barely living wage jobs. They're looking at paying $11 an hour for these mining jobs, these dangerous jobs where they're going to be down in the earth doing these things that that we've seen create massive health problems. So that's a concern for labor um, that I don't think is addressed. Associated with that? I assume if they're union, they get some sort of benefit guarantee. Well, you're that's assuming that they're gonna be union. Oh, I mean, so this is another may, issue. Oh, is this another issue? Union <laughs> jobs. I mean, that they're not even gonna be union jobs? Right. Well, what are we doing here? Oh, all right. <laughs> all right, um, uh, okay. So that, that's the labor perspective. Nancy, anything? I would have a really hard time picking just one thing that I was most concerned about from the previous draft DIS and for where this project stands today. I will say it is improved, but the previous project that was vetted in front of the public in 2009 was horrible. What about it has improved? They've done quite a bit more to um, do engineering controls, things like liners and pump back and water treatment, things that were not a part of the project originally. And they also went back um, to reality and recognized that in order to have the project that they wanna do, this open pit sulfide mine, they were going to need to do a federal land exchange with the US Forest Service. Oh yes, I remember that. And they realized that they needed to examine the impacts of both of those actions, both the environmental impacts of, of the project and the impacts of a federal land exchange. So in that respect, there are improvements in how this project is being um, designed and presented, but there are still fundamental flaws. It still cannot, despite what the press says, what the company says to the press, it still will not meet water quality standards. It will still pollute surface water. It will still pollute groundwater. It's a massive and permanent degradation of a world-class landscape. And what about uh, Paula and Aaron? What, what, what about what this young man had to say about not all mines are created equal uh, and, and not necessarily all sulf sulfide mines? What, what about that? I'm, I have to say that I know the polymet mine more than I might know some mine that might be in another state. And what I've seen really confirms what Nancy was talking about, is that the polymet project is going to result in contamination of surface water. It is going to result in contamination of groundwater. It is likely to destroy thousands of acres of the headwaters of the Partridge River, and that the plan for replacement of wetlands is not gonna restore the functions in terms of keeping water clean. And that what is the most troubling from our perspective as Water Legacy, and we represent a lot of citizens, is that the documents have been made so complicated and they have a huge number of assumptions where there's no evidence, so that an ordinary human being, an ordinary intelligent, even college educated citizen, will not be able to make head or tail out of it. And I, I don't know if that was deliberate, but there are a lot of assumptions rather than demonstration in real world terms of what's going to be happening at that mine. Aaron, Aaron Clins. Uh, two, two points. He's first, with the Friends of the Boundary Water. That's right. Um, first to Tamara's point, 
Uh, the, the first, the EIS, the one that was rejected by the EPA and, and eventually was uh, scrapped and they put up the new version, said that about 25% of the jobs created would be local jobs. Um, and that the rest of them would come from commuters from longer distances or would be brought in from outside. Like the oil fields yeah, in I mean, North Dakota? The, yeah. many, many mines operate on um, even almost uh, temporary housing where you've got, you know, for example, there's a company in uh, Freeport Macaran down in Arizona that has basically the entire town of Morency is owned by the company and they have company housing and it allows them to scale up and scale down their non-union workforce very efficiently because they can say, I'm sorry you're laid off, you have 30 days to move. Um, and one of the things that we're concerned about is, I mean, as I've been looking at the document, I have a similar concern to what Paula was talking about. Some of the things that were laid out more clearly last time are more confusing now. Uh, so for example, they were pretty honest about where their labor force would come from in the last round of this EIS. This time it basically says, uh, if you combine all the jobs that we anticipate to come about, both direct and indirect, most of those will go to local people. And that's the extent of the breakdown that they provide. Okay. Um, and so, it's, and so one, there's a lot of transparency that's lacking from this document. And so I think that's my biggest single concern about it as well. Thank you very much, Aaron. That was a great question, young man. That was good stuff. Okay, and what is your name? Deanna Erickson. Hello, Deanna Erickson, and, and what is your, and what do you represent here? Are you here representing anybody? No, I just hey, myself. Just yourself, we like that. Okay, now you're, since you're not a special interest, what is your question? <laughs> thank you. May I? Oh, go ahead, hold it. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I worked on mining issues in Wisconsin where there's a very different climate politically towards mining. <laughs> yeah, well, the climate in Wisconsin has changed a fair bit. <laughs> Um, but in the, you know, many years, quote unquote, many years ago, a few years ago, it was, it was a different culture. Um, and we were able to pass the mining, mining moratorium law. We, um, thank you. We uh, were able to look at banning sulfide or cyanide in processing mining materials. And what we were doing was looking ahead to put in place uh, legislative protection um, sort of long term so that we could look ahead and, and see ourselves protected in the future. And one of the things I wonder about in Minnesota is are there options for that and is that even possible because of the, the historic mining culture in the state? Did you come here just for this forum all the way from Wisconsin? Or do no, you live here now? I live here now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to be really impressed. Well, that, we should tell our audience that, uh, especially that in the Twin Cities, that uh, there is a, a great deal of, of uh, consternation uh, over the Panoki Mountains uh, in, in the range, the Iron Range, in uh, eastern, northeastern Wisconsin. And the same kinds of battles are taking place there, especially among the Bad River tribe of Lake, is it Lake Superior? They're also Lake Superior, yeah. Chippewa. Everybody up here is Lake Superior, Chippewa, it seems. Uh, but anyway, uh, the Bad River people are, uh, and Mike Wiggins, uh, their tribal chairman, are very much involved in all of that. But that's going to be an iron ore, taconite mine, I believe, versus uh, the sulfide mining that we're talking about up here. But still, it's, it's, it's a big issue there. And these mining issues keep cropping up all over the place, don't they? Aaron Clems. Well, I, you know, as I think what Deanna said is important, and I, I want to point out one thing about how things have changed. In uh, 1989, I believe, is when the sulfide moratorium was passed in Wisconsin, the proof, no, 1998, actually, yeah, sorry, got the, reversed the numbers, my fault. Uh, Scott Walker, then Representative Scott Walker, voted for it. He voted for it, right? So it's, it, this is an issue that I think has become this kind of strangely partisan issue, but it, 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 there's a lot of ins and outs about that. I mean, but I think that there is a, there's a potential for bipartisan agreement about what we're willing to risk and what we're looking to benefit from. Um, we haven't had that conversation yet here in Minnesota. We really haven't had that conversation very seriously. Uh, not since the 1970s, the last time we really had interest in the copper and nickel deposits up here in northeastern Minnesota, when there was a very serious conversation about what we were willing to permit what we weren't. Um, I think we need to have that conversation again in light of what we know now. Paula Maccabee, did you have something to add? Well, I think one of the problems in Minnesota is we think we're a lot better than we are. It's like what Garrison Keeler says that in Lake Wobegon, all of our children are above average. And we really believe in Minnesota 
that we know how to regulate and we know how to protect. And so part of this conversation is getting back to what Nancy was saying before, is that Minnesota has a rotten track record. We have taconite mines, which are theoretically quite a bit less toxic than this copper nickel sulfide stuff. And we can't even get those mines to comply with water quality standards. Our team of citizen scientists have now looked at seven of them, and they're all violating water quality standards. And our pollution control agency and our Department of Natural Resources are content with leaving that status quo where mines don't follow the law. And so part of, I think, our conversation has to be, Minnesota, we are not exactly all above average, and we need to start requiring Speak accountability. Speak for yourself, Paula McAbee. <laughs> OK, so uh, anyway. <laughs> Anyway, we have a real quick question, and it's got to be quick, we know, but we wanted to bring uh, Kristen Larson on because she's one of our community partners, too. Uh, and you are with? Friends of the Cloquet Valley State Forest. You know why I couldn't remember that, right? Oh, that's OK. Thank it's you. a long one. But it's the forest just north of Duluth. And what I want to point out to people is that this isn't just a faraway issue. This is something that affects those of us who live in or near Duluth. And one of the reasons we live here is the wonderful closeness. You can go to a great symphony, and you can be on a lake floating around somewhere where you can hear nothing but loons. This is an important part of our lives. I want to say one thing. Um, our leaders often say, we can have both. We can have these mining jobs, and we can have clean water. And I think there's a little bit in that. <laughs> why, why does it? Why is it always true that the uh, one of the uh, one of the violations of the seven bad words gets applause every time? <laughs> oh well, uh, we, the FCC we just we're just get yeah. about to get rid of uh, we're just get 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 thrown off the air, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the FCC is going to hate us. Uh, well, we must end our uh, pretty much our first hour there. Um, I don't know, where am I here? Um, which microphone do you want me on? All right, well, let's go to this one first. Okay. Uh, we're about to end our first hour, but we're gonna keep going after this uh, for some more questions and answers. But I thought I'd come around to make sure that we close off this uh, wonderful discussion so far. I mean, you guys, you can't know how great this has been for us. Um, but uh, we'll keep going on uh, after we sign off the show. We want to thank our uh, listeners in, in St. Paul, Minneapolis for listening tonight. And we want to thank Maria Morstad and Nancy Sarter for giving, uh, having given up their little time. Uh, we uh, want to say thank you to uh, Paula McAbee. She's Water Legacies, the policy director. Thank you very much, Paula. All right. And Nancy Schultz is, uh, is Water po Resource Policy Director for the Fond du Lac Tribe. Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Nancy, thanks for joining us. Uh, stick around for uh, more questions and answers. And we also had Paula McAbee, Water Legacies Policy Director. Thank you as well. <laughs> more and thanks for Paula. Yeah, oh, sorry. And well, that's you, all right. You Aaron I know we're jumping all over here. <laughs> Aaron Clems directs the Policy and Communications Office of, uh, uh, of the uh, Friends of Boundary Waters uh, Wilderness. Uh, Aaron, thanks for all of your help tonight. Thank you. And uh, we'll get you back again. Yeah, and finally, uh, Tamara Jones. She's the president of the Carlton County Central Labor Body and union rep for United Food and Commercial Workers Local 1189. Thank you for being here as well. And more thanks to you, our live audience here at University of Minnesota Duluth. Uh, Linda Krug, thank you very much. Uh, in the Masters of Advocacy and Political Leadership, uh, co-director of Linda Krug and Y Spano is her pal and, and Suzanne Bonomo. Thank you so much for your uh, work on this thing. Uh, we've got to say thank you to all of you for joining us tonight and stick around, we'll uh, let you go on. So uh, many thanks to David Zirot, our stalwart video producer, director for SPNN and his sound and camera crew, uh, and uh, Kel Heil back at the KFAI studio. Truth to Tell is a co-production of Civic Media Minnesota and KFAI and SPNN for this one. Links to audio archives of this and all of our past shows are available on our own website, truthtotell.org. And uh, we want to say th thank you to Mark Kerner and Peter Hansen and Siobhan Kiernan and Ray Lynn Prokaski and our wonderful crew to feed this show all the way down to Minneapolis. And we'll Thank be, you so much. Yeah, we'll be back again next month with another edition of Truth to Tell Community Connections. 
Peace on Youth Empowerment. And you'll hear this broadcast two Mondays from now on our regular Truth to Tell spot on Monday morning at 9 a.m. on KFAI. I'm Michelle Ali Marati. And I'm Andy Driscoll. See you next time. And please, as always, do take care of each other.